think well, most of you will not be playing with Dr. Kravnik uh, Kenyan. And uh, just I have to say that uh, he is the founder of uh, the science of fire biology. And uh, enjoy your lecture. Thank you. Good evening. I'm very happy to be with you tonight. And uh, we will. Uh, we will have about an hour of slides and then maybe we have an hour of uh, questions, discussions, things like that. Then we can have a break in the middle. Okay. Deciphering energy secrets in heritage. Uh, what we want to do today. I wait five minutes, yeah. Samani, I'll kill the fan Samani, which kill it? Kill the Samani, but I'm shaking. Okay, now that you can hear me, you can start. Uh, deciphering energy secrets in heritage. Uh, you know that as uh, new knowledge uh, develops, as we make new discoveries, scientific discoveries and otherwise, we sort of have new tools with which we can uh, have a different look or find new things in uh, ancient uh, in our ancient heritage and sometimes uh, the new tools that modern science provides us uh, enable us to go as far as rewriting whole chapters uh, of our history or our heritage so I come from let's say a science which is based in architecture and it's called by geometry and it deals, it's a science of shape, uh, how shapes interact with energy. Of course, uh, you know, we architects, when we study the history of architecture, we are dealing mainly with sacred areas, sacred locations on which the monuments uh, are built. So there is uh, this word sacred, this uh, is something that used to be to, to have to do with belief and all that. But now, with new knowledge, we know that it has to do with a certain energy quality. So the fact that you can change your worldview uh, from uh, a symbolic, philosophical, or uh, psychological point of view to a practical uh, energy quality point of view will automatically rewrite many chapters uh, of our heritage. <coughs> So, in order to start, I have to tell you a bit about what I do today so that you know how I will tackle uh, some of the ancient topics. Uh, for example, when, uh, when medicine uh, discovered brain surgery, only when doctors could perform brain surgery did they discover that the ancient Egyptians were actually doing it uh, three or four thousand years ago. Until then, okay, I mean, we saw uh, uh, reliefs of something opening up here and all that, but it, you could say anything. You could say it's, it's uh, removing a skull or a brain or a cap or whatever, but you would never think that they were actually uh, performing brain surgery, removing tumors uh, from the head today with uh, DNA analysis we are opening a new chapter also in discovering ancient links uh, in ancient history. So, our field here is a field of uh, energy. It's a physics of quality that will enable us to understand this ancient worldview. Uh, this physics of quality uh, has another uh, advantage. It's a key to the ancient sciences. With a if you have a physics of quality, all of a sudden, all ancient beliefs, mythologies, and all such things, they become sciences. So you can look at them from a different way. Now, I won't go into 
the physics of quality uh, because we don't have time for that but all I can tell you is the scales of qualities are for example our senses all work with quality scales for example colors are qualities uh, sound notes are qualities so if you have for example a, a string and you put your finger on a certain proportion on that string then you have a mathematical uh, proportion that's a quantitative thing now if you plug the string what happens the quantitative gives something out okay there, there's a certain wavelength that comes out certain vibration that comes out but if there is a person there if there's a receiver there the effect on the receiver that's what we call quality then all of a sudden the effect on the receiver will be a sound but sound will not exist if there's no brain somehow to turn it into from the quantitative to qualitative through one of the scales so the senses use automatically they use color scale sound scale uh, or smell or touch rough and smooth things like that these are qualitative scales so actually we perceive our perceived reality it's not the absolute one it's the perceived one because it's only within a certain range of the senses but we perceive our reality in a qualitative way now there are also uh, very interesting studies showing that the quantitative aspects uh, have their roots in the qualitative the, there's a very interesting uh, uh, book by uh, Marie-Louise von Franz she's in the uh, Gustav Jung Center in Zurich she was heading that center uh, after Jung died and she wrote uh, a book about psyche and number so and she was showing that even the quantitative is rooted in a qualitative perception that produces the quantitative so here this qualitative aspect uh, shall we look at it as subjective and then we don't have a science if we can find objectivity in there in sound in colors and all that then we have a science let's say if I bring a color a red color put it in front of your eyes then you're going to say okay uh, somebody who has a garden who likes roses and she sees the red color she will enjoy it a surgeon who's working with blood and all that he will not enjoy so it's subjective how can we use color as a scale now it's very simple if I put the color behind the person and not in front of him so there is no perception that will go into the meaning level of the brain you will only get the abstract objective effect of that radiation on the body so there are ways to bypass the subjectivity and end up with scales that can be used <coughs> in an objective way so the basic law or one of the basic laws with scales or with quality scales is that you take a scale from one, within one region let's say within the sound uh, region or from within the visual range or something like that and you take them and use them in all ranges from zero to infinity now how can we do that how can we use the red color beyond the visual range or how can we use a sound beyond the range once you use something beyond its limited range then it becomes a scale okay but how uh, how do we we do that and that is achieved by the laws of resonance now we know okay quantitative scales are when I just mentioned them I didn't give an example because 
you know the quantitative skills are based on uh, numbers any instrument uh, the same meters centimeters uh, inches uh, all those things or Fahrenheit centigrade all those things are based on numbers are quantitative scales that means you have a, a quantitative measurement of things and that is limited by the sensitivity of your instruments from the smallest to the largest so quantitative scales are limited by the instrument you use as science develops we expand our possibility for quantitative scales now qualitative scales are limitless and that's the nice thing about them we know that for example in ancient cultures they had a very advanced science of harmonics harmonics today is understood basically as uh, something to do with music but in reality music is just a very small uh, part of harmonics harmonics has to do with the whole universe it has to do with how everything in the universe is linked together like a whole symphony and this linking together is done by one of the very important laws of harmonics for example is uh, resonance so on a first level if you have a string and you hit the string every other string that is either double its length or half its length will resonate with it and this will go on forever from zero to infinity applied to music it will go from the first string in your music to, another, to the last string or to any other string in any other instrument in the room it will resonate with it but that's how we know it in music now imagine that the whole universe is linked together by this law of resonance from the smallest to the largest so the law of resonance from the science of harmonic is a qualitative law that has no boundaries now there's another level also it's not just something half as have half as uh, long or double because in a piano for example if you take a string if you take a note do the next do is double and the next do is double the, the string is always double but between them you have other proportions so in the rows of harmonic it's i won't go deeper into it but you have besides the basic proportion of one to two you have so many other proportions in there that sort of come out of it now harmonics is a science if the whole universe is interacting it can act either quantitatively or qualitatively now we know the science of harmonics uh, from the works of the greek philosopher and mathematician pythagoras so pythagoras is one of the fathers of modern science he came to ancient egypt stayed 22 years in the temples here when he came out he couldn't divulge the science of the temple so the qualitative aspects of harmonics all the laws of nature the powers of nature how they were used how they had control over nature and all that he couldn't divulge all those secrets but there's one thing that he could divulge and that was the quantitative aspect and with that part only with one face of the coin we got our modern civilization our modern western civilization with one face of the coin the other lies hidden behind it so harmonics looked at uh, from the quantitative point of view if you take a string and then you hit it it vibrates it starts vibrating with the whole length so you get a sort of first one half 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 wave form like that and then or if you turn it like that and then what will happen after some time it will change it will take a proportion one to two then it will take a proportion two to three then it will take it will slowly take different proportions take, it will not always stay like that it will take all the different proportions and then it starts again so looking at it quantitatively if you have in creation if you have a wave that start one wavelength this wavelength will has an automatic inbuilt creation of other wavelengths and then every created wavelength will in turn create another series of wavelengths so quantitatively you could look at harmonics as the law that governs everything in the universe that's why Pythagoras said everything is number 
So hidden behind that is the secrets that he taught in his school. And uh, <coughs> there's an interesting story that they took once one of the disciples of Pythagoras because uh, uh, they wanted to know if Pythagoras was teaching them the secrets of the Egyptian temples. And so they wanted to question this disciple. So uh, it was at a time when they burned uh, the school of Pythagoras and they captured some of the disciples and all that and Pythagoras escaped. And so the, the, this disciple cut off his tongue so that he wouldn't divulge all the secrets. Whether the disciple knew the secrets, because if the disciple knew them, that means Pythagoras divulged them, <laughs> which I don't think was the case. But that is something that, th that's harmonics. So instead of looking at only as the laws of music, look at them as the laws of the universe. So for example, great minds like uh, uh, Fontinus, uh, like Kepler, like uh, Newton, uh, all these great minds were working in harmonics in such a way they were all trying uh, to prove that when the planets, for example, all orbit around the sun, they will settle in harmonic proportions exactly like the proportions of the musical notes. So everything in the universe has to settle because if a primary vibration will divide itself around those laws, so as you go on and on and on, everything will divide itself around those laws. So the laws of music are actually the laws of creation. And music would be an application in which somebody is doing something to feel and enter into resonance with the laws of creation, to transform them into something he can hear. So music sort of uh, gives life to the laws of creation. Now, that's why Pythagoras spoke about the music of the spheres. That, that means that the spheres are moving, there are no sound, but they are moving according to musical proportions, but beyond our range. If you go uh, on the internet and look for Carmen of the Spheres, they got the proportions from the music of the spheres, divide them down half, 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 or the proportions between the celestial bodies, and uh, had a, a piece of music like Carmen, so it's called Carmen of the Spheres, uh, so manifesting the proportions of the celestial bodies around the sun. So this is, this shows that the ancient Egyptians had a very, very advanced science of which we only know one aspect, the quantitative. And imagine, if you can imagine with all the advances of modern science that we have, is that hidden behind every law that we have, hidden behind every experiment that we have in science, there is another aspect, a qualitative aspect hidden there. So, now, we developed this physics of quality, we developed instruments. Why, to begin with, why are we interested in, uh, let's say, deciphering ancient heritage with the new tools of subtle energy? Why? Okay, one thing is, okay, if, to know our heritage, to know, but there's something much, much more interesting, you see having only the quantitative aspects, that means we have taken the human aspect out of our experiment, so that becomes objective. If you take the human out of the experiment, you end up with a civilization that, where the human does not play a part in the formula, he's not part of the formula of anything. But if we would have a variable saying how anything we do in science affects the human subtle energy system, then everything will change. Then we will be making a science that we will be ultimately, not just for our leisure, but we could change our whole civilization with it. Now, is there a problem with our civilization? We think, for example, that our problems lie with uh, global warming. We think that uh, they lie with uh, all kinds of pollution. But actually, there is one hidden time bomb in the information age that we are not aware of or 
that we don't want to be aware of. And that is electromagnetic radiation. You see, electromagnetic radiation, we only look at it as I have a source, and if I treat this source the same way I treat other pollutants, because our way of looking at the environment, the old way, is just I have pollution, I reduce it. Very simple. Whatever you have, a pollutant, you reduce it. Okay. When you come to the new age, of the information age, it doesn't work anymore. Because you can reduce the power of a single source, but by the time you reduce the power of one source, you're actually adding millions of other sources at the same time. So, the, the idea that we can reduce electromagnetic radiation is you can reduce the power of the sources, but you cannot reduce the radiation in the air. Today, every office now is turning into wireless. City, cities now are turning into wireless. The whole city becomes a wireless city. So, you have your computer and you have your projector like here. You can connect them through the air. They're also studying on once we have enough electromagnetic radiation in the air that you don't have to plug anything into an electric source. It will just cap it from the air. And there are already some devices like that. They can cap the electricity from the air. Because slowly, slowly, in an office environment, when we have a lot of electromagnetic radiation, we wouldn't need to plug our computers in. We can take from it. So if this is happening, it is disrupting uh, our whole biological system. So first of all, we don't want to be aware of the problem because the industry is behind it, the leisure is behind it. Today, for example, I, I tell my children that uh, you shouldn't use the, the mobile at all. But I'm the one who gives it to my children for safety. So is safety more important or their health more important? You see, today you cannot go back on modern technology. So the thing is, shall we admit that electromagnetic radiation is harmful? Then we're just, it's a scare tactic. Everybody will be scared, everybody will be panicked. And then what? What can we do if we don't have a solution? Only when we have a solution that can transform electromagnetic radiation to our benefit, then we can tell the people it was bad and now we corrected it, you see, but not uh, the opposite. So, the science of biogeometry <coughs> is something that's based on the physics of quality today. It studies the effects of things on our body, how we react to things. It's studies the relationship of our biological system to other things. And that means it's a qualitative thing. It studies the quality of the effects on my body. And by studying the quality of effect on my body, it also uses shapes. And that's a bit uh, strange, but it uses shapes to transform this quality into a beneficial quality. And this might sound strange. How can I have radiation? And then you put the shape and tell me that this shape will make this radiation more benefit. I mean, more benefit out of the beneficial. No, there's no way the mind can comprehend it. But in reality, if we start to analyze, and today many scientists are going to new grounds in analyzing the harm of, from any kind of radiation. Where does the real harm come from? See, you can say, okay, there's a cable in the wall. If I stay one meter away from it, I don't have a problem. Or there's a high tension cable. If I build 50 meters away from it, I don't have a problem. But look at it that way. This is electromagnetic radiation. But any flow of energy will make eddy currents around it. If you have a boat going in the water at a certain speed, okay. If you're near it, okay, you have to keep a certain distance. But you could be away on, on the shore and slowly, slowly, you, you'll see those eddy currents reaching you. So we know that there's a background situation to any motion. 
that produces eddy currents. Now, those eddy currents are still waves. And, but they are not electromagnetic waves. They are like compression waves, because they push eddy currents are compression waves like that. And compression waves are like sound waves. We can actually interact with them with, with shapes, like acoustics. We can interact with them with shapes. So this is where, once we have this new understanding, then we can actually interact with shapes, with all this background uh, energy that's there, and use it to our benefit. There's a background echo there, and that's the main cause of the harm, and we try to use it to our benefit. Once we did that and got lots of results in solving today's problems, my, my uh, I'm not a professional in Egyptology or something like that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer working in solving today's problems, whether they're agricultural or, or uh, whatever environmental problems and all that. But all of a sudden, we find that when we develop this science, all of a sudden, we look back and we have a key <coughs> that maybe they knew at all. Maybe the same shapes I'm using now to transform a certain quality Maybe that ancient Egyptian column, or maybe that thing, but maybe there, it's achieving the same thing. So all of a sudden, I go and start measuring. We don't theorize in biogeometry, it's measurement. Then I go, and I find, could it be luck that they got it? Okay, I try another one, I try another one, I try another one, and all of a sudden, no, they knew that science. And then you wonder, if I managed to develop this science in 30 years, if somebody worked on it 3,000 years, then I'm sure at least whatever we can achieve now with biogeometry, they must have done it, it must have been child's play with them. So that's from where I come. So I'm going to go quickly, show you what biogeometry can do today, and then we go back and look at one or two uh, examples, old examples, I'll take you. There's no time to go into, here I have many, many examples of ancient city planning, of ancient monuments and all that. So I'll just go through them, then from time to time choose one, stop on it a bit, th then go on. So we have now in, uh, in many uh, master's and doctor's degrees, uh, thesis uh, at the University of Cairo and other universities here, uh, that I'm supervising, we managed to have co collect a lot of data in, in the past years and many examples and analyze many things and all that. So uh, this gives us even more insight into some of the old monuments here that the students have analyzed and measured and done that. Now, can I go to the next one? This is uh, many of, of, of the things we're going to tell you today will come out in a book that should be out next month. And th this is the book collected topics on biogeometry, ancient Egypt solution to the modern environmental uh, crisis. But, uh, okay. By understanding the past, we might have a future because I'm not sure we, we have a future. Because you see, electromagnetic radiation, once it comes to a cer certain threshold where the immune system of humans, plants, and animals collapses, then I'm not sure that we have a future. But if we go and look at the sciences of the past and see what <coughs> did they know here or there, in their city planning, in their buildings, in all that, we might come up with things that might give us the possibility of a future. Because uh, when we discuss uh, ancient heritage, for example, we discuss heritage in architecture. We usually look at heritage not in a way where you take a shape like that, a dome, and then um, this is Islamic architecture. Then you take a, a, a sort of column like that, this is pharaonic architecture. No, we don't, uh, heritage, we don't look at it from outside, it's j j just what the face value. Now we have a formula. A formula 
that gives great architecture, that gives classical architecture. This formula is, let's say, you have a uh, function, we have uh, material, you uh, have construction, we have social values. So it's a formula that has, let's say, 10 variables, and you just take that same formula, and if you apply that same formula every time in a different age, you get a different result. But it's the same one, because it comes through the same formula. It's like having, you know, having a sausage machine. It's the same sausage machine with all its parts. Now, whatever you put here, will bring out here, but it's still a sausage machine, okay? But if one of the parts is missing, if you lose one of the parts of this formula, of this machine, then you will never get something that is really, uh, uh, I mean, beyond immortal, let's say, and that's really a mirror of its time. You'll never get that if something is missing from your machine. And what got lost in architecture is the variable that has to do with subtle energy effects on the human energy system. So today we need it more than ever because in ancient times they used to deal with natural energies. Today we have so many man-made energies that, are, that we need this variable more than ever. So by understanding how they dealt with the natural energies, their methods, we might be able to find the solution for ourselves and save ourselves. So this is how sometimes you learn from the past. Okay, we spoke about this. Okay, so this is just going through the points I spoke about. I like to lead the slides, not let them lead me. So I like to speak about the points and then tell them to come up behind me afterwards. Next one. Okay. Now, in ancient times, we, when we look at ancient architecture, it always has to do with those sacred locations, what we call power spots. Power spots are our sacred spots in humanity, like uh, all the, the great mosques that you have, all the healing locations that you have. For example, in, in Mecca, the Kaaba is one of the earliest uh, power spots, maybe the earliest in humanity. Uh, every temple at the time was built on a power spot. So temples for them were secondary. The power spot was the main thing. See, it was the sacred place that was the main thing, not the building that the human person made. It was the light and not the stone or the material. And this, this is important that we understand this aspect that humanity discovered power spots in, from the earliest time. They discovered three things, sacred times, sacred locations, and they discovered a law of resonance between things. So let's say sacred times and sacred locations here. When they looked at animals, they found, for example, that animals, when they, certain animals, w when they felt they were dying, they would go to a certain location and die there. So there were, some of those power spots were actually uh, places where you went to die. So there's a book called the, the History of the City, which explains how we started our human cities. The cavemen in the beginning, when they were just hunting from one place to the other, they, they imitated the animal. They chose a power spot to bury their dead. Because in those power spots, you, you could tell a power spot by, let, let's say, how certain animals go to it. Pigeons would go and circle around it. Uh, there are uh, camel or horses tend to find it. Uh, elephants, when they die, they go to a power spot. So human beings imitated them and they buried their dead there. And then they went on hunting. So whenever they came back to those areas, the actual symmetries 
where the first thing that fixed their journey was those power spots. So it's ironic that the cities of the living started with a location for the dead, you see. But we know that, that today when you have a, a, a church or a mosque or a temple, you usually find the cemetery, you find, uh, I mean, the place of worship, and then you find the cemetery. And many times also some form of healing edifice beside it. So power spots played a very important role in humanity, and power spots were the basis of all architectural monuments. Of course, I'm speaking as an architect, so I must, you, you, you can't avoid the power spots. If you look at the pyramids here in Egypt, it's a sacred plateau. But we miss that so much, because you can easily go to the pyramid and forget that this is a sacred plateau. I mean, do you feel the same reverence when you go to the Giza plateau like when you go into a mosque or a church, something you don't. You think this touristic area and all that. Why don't you say a little prayer when you go on the Pyramid Plateau? Because this is one of the strongest power spots of humanity. So, when, when we see the light as the basis for choosing monuments, uh, or choosing the locations of monuments, then the whole story starts to become a bit different because if I see the light that light maybe it, it's a temple it's a church it doesn't really differ it's always the same light it's this harmonizing energy balancing light how do you know it's harmonizing and energy balancing when you look at the plants in those areas the plants are different than the areas just outside you find the leaves a bit thicker the colors more vivid so it, it looks different then the waters in those areas they are always very clear. I mean, no pollution, nothing. They're always very, very clear. And they can stay thousands of years that clear. So there are ways of just by looking, by observation, of knowing this is a right, a sacred spot. And then if they drink from the water, if they stay in those areas, they see the sick animals go there and they get better. So they start imitating it. And an animal, it's like a scientist exactly, because an animal, uh, he uses the scientific methods. An animal goes to, to a certain area. If he feels sick, he goes to that area. If he gets better, let's say he goes 10 times. He gets better once, he won't go again. He gets better nine times out of 10, then he go again. So it's always this re re repeatability. Now, the power spot is the basis of the energy in biogeometry. Because once we started having a language, a geometrical language of interacting with energy. Now, I'm not the first that's doing research in that. There are about 300 laboratories around the world uh, using geometrical shapes. But most of them are not for the well-being of humanity. They are to create future weapons and things like that or, or to destroy the immunity of others and things like that. But what makes biogeometry different? When I started working on shapes, my background as an architect working with the power spots made me look for a design language that would replicate the energy of those power spots. So you get a science that can only bring uh, sort of harmony in whatever you do. You cannot use it for anything against that. And then when you start using a design language and using geometrical shapes and you can amplify that quality a thousand times, all of a sudden it becomes usable energy that you can use. Okay, once we understand the science of quality, then some errors can be corrected. Magic based on beliefs and illusion instead of a practical science of quality. That's our first error. We think everything in, in ancient times is magic. That is based just on a belief or an illusion or something like that, on rituals, symbolic <coughs> rituals, because we are in an age of psychology. See, so I take Freud and put him 
with the caveman and tell him, explain to me what this caveman is doing. Yes, so, so he takes it. So we end up with magic. We end up with a whole magical world. But once we know that it's not, that's everyone, it's not magic, it's a practical science of quality. This will automatically lead us to the second error we do. Gods. Now, once we know that all energy has all attributes of life in it, you cannot add or subtract things to energy. You see? So, in, in a human being, some aspects might be more, uh, let's say, awakened in, the, in, in energy qualities. In a rock, some of them might be dormant, but they're still there. So, once we understand that the idea of labeling things as gods, I mean, the ancient Egyptians spoke about netters. The word netter comes from nature. So if they said it, these are nature powers. Okay, what are the nature powers in our belief? We could call angels our nature powers, our powers of nature, okay? Then why don't you call your angels your gods? I mean, if they had multiple gods, so do you. So it is the powers of nature are just powers there. And if you, their qualities, their laws, if you know how to in interact with them, that's the first error through the science of quality. If you know how to interact with them, then there's no concept of many gods and all that is not there. But instead, there is a concept of sacredness that arises. Because if you know how to balance and harmonize the powers of nature and look for what harmonizes them, what balances them, understand the design language, then you understand the true nature of the sacred light in everything. So everything becomes sacred, but it's not a god. So these are these errors are due to our stupidity, and we are trying to impose things on them that never really existed. In the Badia. Okay. Now, Bajomtri gives us a new uh, tool. <coughs> okay. Just to give you an idea. Uh, of some of the tools of measurement in biogeometry. Here, we, we, th this is uh, a machine that works on uh, the basis of Chinese acupuncture. So, so it can actually give the energy of lines. And it shows you uh, in graphic tables. Now, the computer has something uh, nice in it. You can convert the graphic tables into colors to make it visual. But this is not what you would call an aura. It's just a conversion of a diagnosis. So uh, the computer, when it has green, it means it's in balance. When uh, you have, let, let's say, red like this, then it's overactive, and violet like this is underactive. So here you will see uh, a human being in a normal state. This would be the normal state of any human being. You see, you have those opposite colors a lot. And then this picture, which is the same like this, this is when we apply the science of biogeometry shape in the area around the human being, the, the body functions are automatically uh, sort of harmonized and you get this. So this is one of the effects of biogeometry that we use today as a modern science. Okay, what I'm going to show you now, uh, very quickly, some things with research, applications and projects and we'll go through them very quickly and then we go into uh, heritage. Okay, this is something uh, we did with Dr. Mazaro uh, Emoto in his laboratory in Switzerland. Uh, I sent him one of those cubes that you see here. This cube uh, we developed in Switzerland. It's like this one, uh, something like this. This is what we call, it's part of a home kit. And it has our geometrical shapes, the big shapes like that. It has a whole series of them uh, photographed and reduced with laser into this. So instead of bringing harmony into large areas, this is what we call a home kit. This is to harmonize one home, make full protection from electromagnetic radiation, earth radiation for a home. So what we did, we sent this cube 
to the laboratory in Liechtenstein and we asked them to give us a uh, sort uh, of the effect of this group. The way they analyze it is they uh, so go under the microscope, they freeze water and take pictures of the crystals. So this is the normal water, tap water in the room before they put the cube up. And then they put the cube up and from the same tap water they make again the same pictures and see what you get. So actually the, this effect on the subtle energy here has a physical effect because many people think that manipulation of subtle energy is something psychological. You see, it's not psychological if it can have a physical effect like what you see here. Next. Now on plants, we managed, uh, that was in the University of Wageningen. Uh, that's uh, an apple orchard project. The idea here uh, is to grow apples and then uh, put some sort of parasite in the field because this is a parasite research center. So you put the parasites there and with the apples in order to try methods, organic methods of fighting off the parasites. So we did three years uh, research with them and for example uh, here you see one of the things that, that came out of this research is the shelf life. Because you know when you get uh, fruits or vegetables and all that, you have to irradiate them. In, in most cases, you use uh, very small doses of radiation to give them a longer shelf life. Today, they're trying to uh, develop new bacterial solutions from, from natural things that you can do that. So with this development of bacterial solutions instead of radiation, we also tried our method by just putting shapes in the ground here. And you see, here after two months, uh, these are the normal apples, the control apples, and these are the apples from our uh, test. Th this is uh, the whole center with every orchard here and its number and wh what has been done in it because we did several experiments. So we managed to increase the production by about between 20 and 60 percent, uh, depending on the different areas, and then we managed to reduce the parasites when the trees were already infected between 10 and 20 percent reduction of parasites. When we put the shapes before the trees were infected, then there was no infection at all. So when we put, for example, every season they put a new group of trees and we test new parasites on them. And we put our shapes. When at the end of the season they come for the new season, after that, they don't get infected at all. <coughs> but this was supposed to be a parasite research center. So we would have to move every time to a new area that hadn't gotten a treatment in the previous year in order uh, that the parasites would stay there. So this is some of the work by Geometry in Architecture. Next one. See the difference after two months. Next. Okay, then we did uh, potato seeds. The idea of the potato seeds was, uh, you know, for example, we have to get potato seeds from Holland. Uh, we can't produce, our, our crops here don't produce potato seeds. Uh, potato seeds need a certain vitality, you need a certain sugar content and all that. And uh, th you have to import them always. Now, here, we, the idea was to work on uh, the storage areas to work on the containers so that we could actually uh, affect the potato seeds and then when they send them to other countries where <coughs> we don't have an access with biogeometry, the potato seeds itself has the balancing energy of biogeometry, so it can fight off uh, uh, the parasites, it, it can uh, increase the yield and all that. So, right. yes. Uh, okay, we'll just pass, uh, finish one part and then take a break. Okay, then back together. I'll go quickly th through the researches without explaining them. 
so that we can go to the heritage. We have them in the brochure at the back. Okay, okay, but let me go through. Here, we're going to, I mean, we did planting with salt water from the Red Sea and next one. You see, this is the control with fresh water. This is using salt water, you see it shrivels, and this is using special by geometry shapes in salt water. So we managed to use salt water. Batkin. With chicken, we did poultry projects also, and we managed to increase the weight, uh, not use any antibiotics, not use hormones, we canceled all that, increase the weight, reduce the time. Batkin. Here are the data. Next. Okay. We have, we developed a, a mobile phone chip. I'll tell you, we'll show you how we tested it. We're in Ilbatkele. We tested it with infrared cameras on the human being, Ilbada. Here you see the control is 34.1 degrees centigrade taken here somewhere in the forehead near the phone. If usually when you put the phone, the temperature rises a bit. Now there's controversy whether this is just a heat reaction from the body or is it harmful to the body. I won't go into that. But, but here we see uh, when we use biogeometric shapes, you automatically reduce it at the same spot. Here you see with the product warm on the body, it goes down to 33.3. With uh, here with a mobile chip on the phone to 33.4. With here with 33 that's using uh, both of them should be the shapes in, in the room like that the big biogeometric shapes in the room <coughs> next here this shows also uh, this is a device called eta scan which shows you uh, different points in the body giving you energy level of every point you see yellow is good black is bad red is medium so here is a control test, you see, a, con a, a person here, well, we don't have, uh, there's no light anymore here, it's out, but I have in the first one here, I have a control one, and then here, you see, when you start a mobile phone for five minutes, see what happens to your brain, turns all black. Actually, we have other tests done on the kidneys, done on sexual organs, done on the heart and all that, but just here is just choosing one part. And then we tried different solutions, you see. So with this, with the same phone, <coughs> eight minutes here and 10 minutes here, <coughs> with this is a space harmonizer cube, that means one of those cubes is in the room, like that, then it automatically gets better that way. Here is when you have a chip on the phone. We have this chip that you put on the phone. Next one. We'll skip this one. This is a carpet to protect against uh, cancerous earth radiation, earth radiation that can cause cancer. Uh, next. We do work on airplanes with Boeings, on passenger cars, <coughs> on all areas that have a lot of electromagnetic radiation. That's our main. Uh, uh, I mean, area of work. Not we entered in also in a hepatitis C project here in Egypt and got very good results. But we just uh, Come on. This is showing the mechanism of how the shapes that we have resonate with certain energy pulses inside the body. Okay, come on. Come on. Come in. Okay, now we'll take a break and then after the break I'll give you an idea of the application of biogeometry on one area in Switzerland called Hamburg that we did with the Swiss government and the mobile provider there would show you the problems the people had, all the health problems and, um, and it's a human application and then we will go into some <coughs> ancient planning of cities also quickly and then I'll give you based on this knowledge uh, rewriting some aspects of the pyramids so I'll give you out from our point of view which is based on practical measurements we do that in our courses we don't tell them this effect and this effect 
when we do our courses, we teach them to measure and they do it for themselves. The, the students go and do that for themselves. So now we can take a 10 minute break and then we can come back and we continue. But what we mean by physics of quality? Do you understand what we mean by physics of quality? Does everybody understand the difference between the, the basics of physics of quality? Can I have any response? Do you understand what we mean? In the sense of um, quality is like the example of social. Okay, I'll say to the you see, this, uh, this lecture is about heritage. And if I go into detail explaining more about our projects and about physical quality, we won't have time to enter the application of heritage. That's why I have to just open doors like that and physical quality to come to the topic. So my idea here was just to tell you where I come from to enter into the topics. But it's very one simple way of understanding. I give you, uh, for example, uh, the example of the string and the mathematical relationship that turns into sound. Another thing would be if you have salt. Okay, when you look at salt, you don't say automatically, your mind doesn't tell you this is sodium chloride, you don't have something analyzing it. You take it and put your mind and say salty. So salty is, is a quality. Now, all, once you understand the physics of quality, then you understand that the idea of sodium chloride and salty are complementary. You need this and you need this. There's an erroneous way of thinking that in ancient times, in, in the, the Greeks and the Arabs and all that, they had only four elements, let's say, from which the whole universe was created, and now we have more than 100. No, look at it that way. They group the quantities into the qualities. So when you go into the ancient uh, text here, or we have a lot of, here in, in Egypt, or when you look at some Chinese texts of Feng Shui, or, or the five elements of the Chinese and everything, how can the whole universe be made of five elements? It's not made of five elements. The elements are just a symbolic of equality. So I, I give you, when I spoke about an eddy current, I'm going to show you one of the pictures here. When a current moves like that, if, if I move like this, I produce here, or like if you blow in water like that, some, I produce here quality going clockwise, here another one going anticlockwise, and then here compression, and here the opposite I'm taking from it. So you end up, any motion has four qualities. So it depends. You can relate it to the four qualities to motion. You can relate the four qualities to, uh, depends, qualities such as airy, watery. Uh, you can. So every culture divides those four qualities depending on the subject it is tackling and the field it's doing. In medicine, they could tell you for other qualities, phlegmatic and things like that. So putting everything into four qualities, the Chinese added, they took the center and put the fifth one, but in general, it's the basic key of motion, primary motion and secondary motion. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, for example, they had the Nile going like that. So automatically, you have a quality here, different than equality here. The, on the right side of the Nile, you'd have energy turning clockwise. It, that means it gives an upward push to energy, helps life and planting and all that, so it's good for everyday life. On the other side, the left one, like in all religious activities, you turn anti-clockwise and so it goes in into the other dimensions. So they knew I'm going to arrange my whole country accordingly. I'm going to put life here, death here. You see? So this the four qualities this is having a completely new look that actually complements our look of, look of looking at things. <coughs> but what you must understand, your senses, your scales of evaluating the world around you are qualitative scales. So that's how our senses work. 
you see. And I'll give you an idea about this. A very simple idea. Take a table like this, put your hand on it, and move it like that. Okay? You would think this is smooth. Okay? Now, get two things in front of you. Let's say coffee, and then uh, something else, a fruit juice. And while moving this hand like that, touch each. If you touch, let's say, the coffee, you might all of a sudden, and then you touch the fruit juice, the texture of the table, your fingers could become sticky or smooth. This shows that even the this touch sense has an inbuilt quality scale in it. See, because it can change according uh, to, all, to whatever uh, you're using, you see. So, this is a, just an idea to give you this science of quality. When I apply it now to ancient monuments, you'll understand more about what we're saying. But I have to go through, quickly through those things, to enter into some ancient heritage things. If I uh, omitted the first part, you would think that the second part, when I go into heritage, that it's theories, that I'm giving the theories. But what I do is usually I give a course, and then I take the people and tell them, test that, measure this temple, go measure that, go measure that, bring me measurements, show me that. So you verify for yourself. You don't take my word for it. Okay? So here, for example, in Switzerland, uh, there is this town of Hamburg. I want to see them. Let us see. Get a medium. Okay? We make a compromise between. So here in Switzerland, they have this area above St. Gallen, it's called Hamburg. And this became, let's say, the focus of war between the industry gov and government and the environmentalists and, and all uh, the, the people uh, working with ecology and with things like that in Switzerland. So after three or four years of really fierce war between them, uh, the people here, they want uh, a very simple solution. It sounds simple. All uh, mobile or cellular towers should be outside residential areas. Yeah. That's number one that all uh, such experts want. Now, the second one would be that the norms that we have today are norms according to the possibilities of the industry, not according to our health standards. Yes. It's exactly like the car pollution. You make it according to the industry, not according to really to what we uh, need for our health. So they say, the building biologists in Switzerland said that we need to reduce the norms by at least 90%. So reduce the power and then take the towers away. Now those things go against each other. Because if you take the cell towers away, you have to increase the power. You can't reduce it. So, so, it's, so it ended up with just riots, uh, those people wanting to dynamite the towers and things like that. And uh, I graduated from Zurich, from the Polytechnicum there, and uh, I had my doctor's degree from there. So uh, they were, uh, the government there, and the mobile providers were aware of what I was doing, but really had no understanding. They didn't understand what biogeometry was, because it, it doesn't sound very, it's, it's too good to be true, you know, putting a geometric shape and solving everything. It's too good to be true. So one day, and that's, I say, the miracle is that the boss of Swisscom, the Swiss provider, that's the miracle. He decided to ask me to come to Switzerland to solve the problems when the pressure got too much. I say that's the miracle because uh, 
some people said what I achieved was the miracle, but it's really that the industry asks, and they wrote to the people, look, we can't do what you, what you want. But there is somebody from Switzerland, uh, but he's an Egyptian, he graduated in Switzerland, he has doctor's degrees here, so he's a Swiss scientist, but an Egyptian, and he is coming with a way in which we can keep every, all our industrial things in place, and he will just transform everything and your, your life, he'll restore your quality of life. So before I went there, the newspapers were already, <laughs> you know, I went there and they say, how come Swisscom and the government, uh, are they trying a scam on us or are they bringing the, the, the master, uh, I don't know, from a uh, priest from the Egyptian temples or master <laughs> I mean, they didn't think, because they, there is no uh, uh, background about any qualitative science, you think quantitatively. So that's the situation here. They had another situation that we have here in Egypt, a controversy. In Switzerland, they are very <coughs> conscious about the environment, this touristic area. So they don't want to put any towers here. So they put the tower in the church. So this caused another problem. <laughs> yes, having it outside, it spoils the view. Having it in the tower of the church, it's, it's not accepted by the people there that they use their church for that. You know, we have this, we also have this problem here in Egypt. So let's go to the next one. Here, it's in the tower, here. Sometimes I, they hide it that way, you see. My wife took that picture in America, how they hide it inside the trees. Yeah, the tree might not be very happy about it, but uh, okay. Next one. So this is, these are the shapes that we use in this town family. This is a, a study, this is the original study uh, in German that came out. And I did some English translation on the side, but we'll go quickly through that. Come on. Next one. You see, okay, here the people on weekends, when many tourists came in the area, and especially, you know, when they come and ski in winter, the, the radiation can sometimes be reflected and increase through the snow and many mobile phones. The residents of that area, you see, every resident of the area is walking with those measurement devices. <laughs> yes, they're walking in town in the streets and the houses it, because so many experts have gone there. That they are there, the day is, is it's, the power is raised a bit or they detect something. You know, they, they have loud voice, the Swiss. They, then they attack the government next day straight away. They go to the newspapers. So here, you see, every family has this. And they have to go even and we can down to the cellar down there where they're protected from the cell radiation. Otherwise, they get headaches and problems like that. Next one. Next. OK, next, I'll go quickly through some of them. Here are some of the shapes, but we'll go next. Next, again. OK, stop here. Here, in order not to lose time, we, we go to the results. Dr. Yvonne Gili, this is the, uh, a medical doctor from the uh, uh, Sangalan uh, government there and she came and supervised this research. So in the beginning we were speaking not of treatment because biogeometry is an environmental science. So you can even you can change the health of a person's quality of life and everything and still call it an environmental harmony and not a medical treatment. That's the difference. So we said okay then we will not start uh, testing people at the hospital or uh, writing what kind of illnesses they have and all that. What they do is they have a 12-page questionnaire called an electrosmog assessment questionnaire. Every six months in Switzerland, they bring out a new one. And that's the official one used in Switzerland and Germany, the, this uh, questionnaire. And there's a team, they go and they make their surveys. So these people went and here, they take in general, severe symptoms are brown, medium, mild, and no symptoms. And then they put it graphically to show like that, that most of the people there have severe symptoms. 
Okay, after applying biogeometry, they did the same survey, the free, see? This, it turned exactly the opposite. Now, next one. Here, you have the biggest effect that we found there, really a very marked effect in the psychological uh, part. Because many people were saying, for example, uh, I'm not enjoying life. For no reason. I'm, not, I'm just not enjoying it. Why? Do you have a problem? Money problem? No. What do you have? Nice children, nice wife, good business and everything there. Okay, what's wrong? Still not enjoying life. Why? Well, he's sitting at home. You have a problem with your wife? No, I don't want to speak to her. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just something is happening like that. So, and then, or they can tell you, uh, I have no will. Another thing is, they can't stand each other, they're fighting all the time in the families. When they go on the streets with the neighbors, they are always, uh, you know, looking at each other, hated any problem, they fight together. So it was th this tenseness in the interaction of people. So in the beginning, we thought this was not in, a, in, in the official questionnaire. In the official questionnaire, uh, I mean, the Swiss people there, I mean, the people who do the, the, the evaluation, they are not really concerned if you're happy or you're not happy. I mean. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, this was not their problem, but when it was everywhere, we said, okay, they, these people might have a problem. We didn't take too much consideration. After we installed our shapes, seven days later, then the same people come. I'm very happy now, you know. <laughs> You're crazy. No, 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 I'm really happy. Everything's, I really enjoy life. I like now to walk, I see the flowers, I see this, I see this. So we started saying, okay, now the other one said the same thing, the other one said the same thing. So we started saying, oh, we might get some psychologists then to come into this, and maybe electromagnetic radiation has an effect on, uh, on this psychological thing. But it wasn't in the questionnaire in the beginning. So I added, I, I added it and made my questionnaire with additional things. So that is to show, this is the additional part uh, in the questionnaire. <coughs> then the head area. By most people, the head area was also uh, affected. There was a big, very big change in the head area. Epilepsy, uh, children who had up to five epileptic fits per day, all of a sudden had none. Uh, like they have a certain headache there that they associated, they tell us a headache like a storm in the head, like that. Now, this was reduced. Uh, they have uh, like this pitch in the ear, but instead of saying uh, this tone like tonight, like things like that, no, they call it, there's a, they tell you it's a different type. The one that comes from electric smoke, they call it broom tone because it's it, it tells broom because it tells it goes in the ear like that, it turns like that. It, it's if it was a pitch like that, okay, but it, it goes in the head. So things like that. Uh, so we have we notice significant results here. Other things like high blood pressure. In many cases, 60% of the cases was reduced. Uh, uh, heart palpitations for no reason when they woke. This was reduced. Uh, rheumatic problems were reduced, chronic fatigue, because one of the main problems was they couldn't ha have good sleep. And if you ha don't have good sleep, then so many other things are there. And when they slept better, because pineal and pituitary are most affected by radiation, and now uh, they felt better. So if we go to the next one. Here, okay, I have a list. Here we have a list because if somebody wants to know how they calculated those tables, then you have to know, of course, what is the symptom. Is it heart? Uh, is it this, this? So here, we take it by symptom. So here we say, for example, uh, if you have nervousness, if you have lack of sleep, uh, or skin problems like eczemas and things like that. So it's a list of all the problems uh, that got better. But we are making something very clear here, uh, because we said, the first reaction to this was a huge attack on the cellular industry. So we said two things. First of all, scientifically, if you solve a problem, <coughs> 
it is no indication of who caused it. I mean, it's only an indication that by geometry solved it. So you can't say this is scientific proof that electromagnetic radiation uh, has a bad effect on. This is the work of other people, not mine. Now, the second thing is what we said there, because we are a science of quality, we said that all those sources go into resonance together and the eddy currents in the background and they create a situation in which everything, all the sources take part. It's not cellular tower, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. Because if you're sitting in front of your computer like that, then don't tell me that the cellular tower is harming you. Then you have 90% from the computer and 10% from the cellular tower. If you're sleeping at night at home, then 90% of your problems come from the cable in the wall behind your head that is directly affecting your pineal gland and your pituitary gland. So you get low melatonin and you don't sleep well. Melatonin is a tumor suppressor, so you have a problem there. And then the pituitary is the master gland of all hormo hormones in the body, you get all those. So you put your head in the charger there, you put it on the wall eight hours a day, and then you complain about, let's say, uh, some transformer near your house or health tower or something like that. No, we need an awareness that all the sources, and this is science of quality. Science of quality tells you resonance happens between the courses. They add the currents in the background, and that's what brings the problem. So, next one. Next one. Here, you see the parliament uh, start taking motions, you, you know, with our success, they came out and start taking uh, motions against the industry. Next. Then, all the, the media started doing the same thing. Next one. Okay, here this is an important thing because the Swisscom is, th this is engineer Jörg Studer from Swisscom. Uh, this is an official article that came out uh, in one of the magazines of Bob Bjorgi here. And they are uh, sort of supporting this idea of science of quality about the electromagnetic sources interacting together because it's a stressful situation, you see. The, the science of quality now about resonance and thing, because until now, if you take any electronic engineer and tell him that, uh, let's say, 2.4 giga of, of, uh, of a cellular phone can enter into resonance with uh, 50 or 60 hertz, here, they tell you there's no relationship at all. Yes. But if you tell a musician that the longest string on the piano, which is wavelength, can enter into resonance, there's an octave thing, then it tells you, of course, the law of harmonics says they enter into resonance. Otherwise, we would call the notes from one to hundred. We wouldn't say do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, and then start do again. I mean, it's not somebody who ran out of names. So, <laughs> so no, it's, it's because it's a repetitive thing. So if this repetitive thing works on strings wavelength, then it, would, it will work also on wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. And that's what Swisscom here is actually supporting this theory. It, it, one of the reasons also is supporting it because the resonance idea makes everybody part of the blame. <laughs> so, so instead of one. Next one. Okay, here Karim from the land of miracles. Oh, uh, you know, what, what we did, you know. Uh, things like that. Okay, next one. Yeah, yeah. And the, here uh, things like, okay, I did. Okay, I did command. See here are the shapes we used. We used some shapes to act at a distance. Because near this town, around it, we had military maneuvers and they were putting raiders and things like that and, and missile uh, 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 visioning things and so with all this missile guidance and all these things <coughs> and the people were thinking about the mobile tower so we couldn't go into the military areas so we devised geometrical shapes that can sort of radiate the effect at a distance and then we would put them and adjust it according on each one. When they install a tower here, the military, the people there 
next day they have some of my shapes they get, they start putting the shape and aiming at it when they put things here they aim at it so they're taking care of the whole situation and these are the shapes next one next one see the people here are showing how they were they had these all over the town in the streets showing all the tourists that come to the area showing them uh, how they are living they have to go in the, in the cellars and all that okay see the birds the migrating birds came back because in areas like that the first thing that goes away are migrating birds bats one day i went there they're very very happy i said what the bats are back the bats are back i said good for you <laughs> yes but a, a bat the, the, the farmer knows because a bat is very sensitive to, to radiation but the thing that pleased the farmer most were the problems with the cows you, you know in switzerland huh, a cow is more important than a wife you know that <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, ladies, there's nothing. <laughs> no offense, no offense. But you know, the cow milk gives, <laughs> gives, you know, milk, chocolate, cheese, the whole economy of there. And then all of a sudden, you have all problems with the health of the cows or infertility. Th th then it's now all those things got better. Now, one good thing about all that is the idea of placebo effect has no place there because once animals and birds and plants okay. are part of your experiment there's no placebo effect mm -hmm. unless you think that the cows speak Arabic <laughs> <laughs> then there might be okay next one see here even in winter we had the, the birds and next we'll go quickly back can she come in come in come in these are the shapes that we're using in the towers come in next next Next, that, that's some shapes need to be adjusted. These are the towers that were away on mountains and were affecting them. And I'll show you what we did for the next. See here, we're putting shapes up there, aiming them. Next, see, shapes are aimed at different sources in, in the area here. Next one. And then here, there are the workshops in that area everybody was working with me they were helping inventing things so this is a like a flower like that that you can adjust put shapes on it and emit in all directions next one this is uh, a letter they wrote to me from, from there you see that uh, after that project uh, they approved five million for research in switzerland due to the success of that project but the approval is not for me <laughs> okay next one now, in biogeometry, we have a harmonic table, less a dimensioning system, you see, proportion, dimensioning system to design those shapes. And this dimensioning system, there is today in the science of harmonics, we know harmonics the way it is in music, it's a quality, quantitative system. And the quantitative system gives us the musical notes. Now we have a different one, a qualitative system, in which we start from the opposite. We start from the quality of energy in sacred power spots, how it affects the human body. And then we look for numbers and qualities that are in resonance with this quality. So we get a series, a qualitative series, but it's not, there's no mathematical relationship in it because it's not quantitative. The only relationship is that they all have the same resonance aspect with the sacred thing. Then we take those numbers and we develop a harmonic system from those numbers to get a qualitative harmonic system. So if you're a designer, designing a chair, designing a house, designing anything, you don't have to know biogeometry. Once you apply at least two of those dimensions in whatever you're doing, resonance happens and you get the same energy quality in the room. Okay, next one. See, this is an example, a chair designed by Dr. Sawi, who works with me. And we apply the harmonic system on a chair design. We did straight lines, just proportions and angles. And now we put person on, on that chair. And we see here, that's the same apparatus. You don't see it well here, but a 54% improvement in the brain, 
45% in the lungs and 7% in the intestines. You see, just by sitting on that chair. So that means you apply the harmonic system to any design. You can apply it to the textiles you're wearing, things like that. You see, we have a professor of textiles here, so of course he plans to apply it in everything. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you can get those effects. So it's a very simple way of bringing the sacred quality into design. Now, when we go into heritage, we're going, did they have as their main concept this working with the light of this quality of the sacred power spot in every activity of their life like we do here? If we manage to do that, that's, what, that's how we're going to tackle heritage. Look how they did it. Next one. Now, I, I did it in architecture.